Isaiah chapter 40. I'll start by reading the whole chapter. Isaiah chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. O Zion that bringest good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hands, and meted out heaven? with the span, and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor hath taught him? With whom took he counsel, and who instructed him, and taught him in the path of judgment, and taught him knowledge, and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are as a drop of a bucket, and are counted as the small dust of the balance. Behold, he taketh up the isles as a very little thing. And Lebanon is not sufficient to burn, nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Amen. To whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will ye compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold, and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation chooseth a tree that will not rot. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. Have ye not known? Have ye not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as tent to dwell in, that bringeth the princes to nothing. He maketh the judges of the earth as vanity. Yea, they shall not be planted. Yea, they shall not be sown. Yea, their stock shall not take root in the earth. And he shall also blow upon them. And they shall wither. And the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. To whom then will ye liken me? Or shall I be equal? Saith the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high, and behold, who hath created these things, and bringeth out their host by number. He calleth them all by names, by the greatness of his might, for that he is strong in power, not one faileth. Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. 
I could just leave it there. Look at that. God just giving glory to himself as he as he as he as he just lifts up his own power and, and talks of his own strength, taunts the world in that in that statements that are made as a form of question. To whom will you liken me, or, or, or whom is my equal? Who directed my spirit? Haven't you known? Don't you understand these things? And as I'm reading that scripture, it just all comes to, to it, I'm just flooded with the events that have been going on lately. And the, the images come to my mind of even youths being faint and people being without and people, just as the Bible says here, as grass that's withering and fading. It's not what I'm talking about today specifically, but in thinking about John and how I like to cop, often keep my, my sermons uh, when I'm traveling about focused to the area or the church that I'm at. I, I started to think about the Apostle John, and then I said, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with the greatest man. I'm going to talk about John, the greatest born of woman, the Baptist. Right. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, the scripture says, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem, and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double all her sins. This comfort here we see is directly pointed and offered to God's people. The world's not going to get this comfort. The world's not going to feel, feel strengthened by the hand of God, especially in turbulent times. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, is what God is crying out. And he's even sending a man to do so. It says here that iniquity is pardoned. And here it's, it's received double at the hand of God. In other words, he's got a double measure of blessing and comfort and strength available for his people. And nuts to the world, essentially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. The voice of who? Him. A specific voice coming from a specific man. In the wilderness, a man that's separate. A man that is distinct. A man that is out in his own. And he's crying out. Crieth. What does he say? Well, he's speaking. And the question is always remaining. Who is listening? There's a voice crying in the wilderness. Who is listening? As he says, prepare ye the way of the Lord. It's his charge. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. What was he to do? Verse 4, it continues. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. He's making a highway that is straight. He's, he's taking a valley and exalting it. He's taking a mountain and he's making it low. He's taking that which was crooked and straightening, and that which was rough is being made plain. What's happening here? He's crying, prepare the way of the Lord, and what's the Lord going to do as he arrives? He's going to take the obstacles. He's going to take the challenges. He's going to take that which is high and make it low, that which is low and make it high. Even everything for who? His people. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Their iniquity is pardoned. It's been made straight. And who pardoned it? The gate. The way. The glory is his. Verse 5 it says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. What a day that will be. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And that's the only reason why we can count on anything coming to pass as far as prophecy goes, is because the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Amen. The mouth of some man isn't going to give you something. It is a promise, and you can just bank on it. Amen. It's the mouth of God. Even as we go preaching the gospel, do we not say, hey, hey, just quit looking at me. Look at the Bible. The Bible here is where the promise lies. Amen. In the God that cannot lie. Verse 6. The voice said, cry. He said, what shall I cry? We should be thinking the same thing when God tells you to cry. What do you want me to say, Lord? Amen. And look at the statement. All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Not any other God. Our God's word shall stand forever. Amen. As we go and we talk to these false religions, or even the one guy today that says, Oh, I just believe all religions are true. I'm a Muslim. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting that the Muslims that have their Allah, that have their Muhammad, are now saying that, that cry of oneness. Oh, all the gods are the same. We'll, we'll get a hold of all of them. We, yeah, they're all working in our lives. Their word shall not stand forever. This word shall. Amen. We can count on that. But notice, notice the draw of the world is to that, that oneness, that one cry of a single God that is inclusive. 
What is he crying? Well, he's crying what he believes. He's crying what he's told to say. The word of our God shall stand forever. And he's crying to his people the message that God has him to pass on. And that is what? The, the world's frail. As grass is, grass is going to wither. But my people will be comforted. My people will be strengthened. They shall receive double at the Lord's hand for their iniquities. And who is this man? Who is this voice crying? Go to Matthew 3. We already know I gave it away. The voice of him. Well, who is he? Amen. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. Matthew chapter 3 and verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And every day more and more, do you not feel that? Do you not feel the kingdom of heaven is at hand? 2,000 years ago, perhaps people looked at John the Baptist strangely. The kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, what do you mean? Well, he was talking about Christ's first coming. He was talking about Christ's birth, and, and many did not witness that. But he was talking about the first coming. The coming of the Lord. We're now looking at the next coming, right? We're looking at the kingdom of heaven at hand in a different fashion. And our same cry ought to be, repent ye to this world. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, and I love when the Bible makes it clear for us, the voice of one, before it said the voice of him, now it's specific, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths Straight. And that's the title of the message today. The voice of one. The voice of one. And that's John the Baptist. We know him as the cousin of the Lord. We know him as the one that leaped in the womb of his mother when he heard the salutation of Jesus' mother as she walked in. We know him as the one that was filled with the Holy Ghost from that very womb that he leapt in. And he's preaching raw and hard and focused to a generation of vipers, repent ye! And he's trying, as the Bible shows here, to prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. John here is a preacher. He's a humble preacher. He says, I have need to be baptized of thee. We saw that recorded in John's Gospel. I have need to be baptized of thee, is what he said. Bold, though base among men, there's so much to learn about a man like him. The voice of one, this one, John the Baptist, bold and yet base, humble. Especially at times when we feel isolated, we feel alone, we feel unrelatable, we feel there's a lack of fellowship, and, and uh, there's a group here that's experiencing that. Sometimes it seems like you're the only ones that are going out there and trying to make a difference, trying to cry and spare not, trying to, trying to see the way of the Lord as a straight path to those that don't even know Him. When we feel isolated, when we feel alone, when we feel unrelatable, think of a man like John the Baptist who purposely put himself out into the wilderness in order that he could have fellowship with God at that time. The voice of one. John the Baptist, in several points, was one who knew who he was. Go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John the Baptist was one who knew who he was. He knew he was sent from God. John 1 and verse 6 says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And there's, there's the, the Apostle John giving credence to him, giving, giving the stamp of approval. He was sent from God. His name was John. Look over in verse 23. It says, He said, when he was asked, What sayest thou of thyself? Who art thou? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. He had no qualms with knowing that he was that voice. He was that one that Isaiah prophesied so long ago. He knew he was one that was sent from God, and you too today are one that is sent from God. Romans 10, verse 15, it says, How shall they preach except they be sent? And did not your Lord say, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel? Amen. You've been sent. You've been given that commission. And so even as John was given that charge to go and preach in the wilderness, to go and say, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. As he was sent to make his path straight, so are you given that same command. 
Go and make the way of the Lord, which to this lost and dying world is always so confusing, always so confounding. How many times do we hear today, uh, be a good person? Uh, I, I think so, or maybe, I, I don't know. They have a crooked path to get to yeah. God. They have a mountain that they need to climb. They have a valley that they need to get through. They need a straight path. They need a mountain made low. They need a valley lifted up and exalted so that there is a plain way to the Savior. Amen. And John the Baptist was given that ministry, and you too. How shall they preach except they be sent? God says, go ye. And then the same spirit of John the Baptist. Be one who knows you're sent from God. Be one who's confident that the Lord puts you there. I don't know how many times I come to a door and I'll say to somebody, God put me here. I was sent here. I came all the way from Toronto to your door. Why are you going to turn me away? There's a reason I'm here. The Lord wants me here. I was sent of God. Amen. Amen. They'll reject it sometimes, sure. And John the Baptist faced the same thing. Go to verse 7. It says, The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And so are we, as a witness. Come as a witness to bear witness of the true light that is Jesus Christ, that others might believe through our words. We're not that light. And we use that term, I got somebody saved. But all of us have an understanding of the truth of the matter is that he is the true light. We are simply one that is bear witness, bearing witness of that light and bringing it to somebody in a straight path so they can get to that true light. I'm not that light. Of course I'm not saving everybody. This is the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came to his own, and his own received him not. But we saw it today, glory to God, many receiving him, given power to become the sons of God, born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but born of God. Amen. And it's because... Somebody that knew they were sent from God went to somebody else and said, Hey, you're confused. you got a mountain in front of you and, you th and it's repent of your sins. You've got a valley in front of you and you think it's be a good person. You've got a crooked path to God which you've lied with your own good works. No, let me straighten that out for you. Let me give you a straight path to God. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Amen. John knew he was one that was sent from God. He was also one who put Christ in the proper place. John chapter 1 and verse 15. It says, John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. He knew the place that God deserved, and that was the preferred place. He is preferred for he was before me. Wherever I was fashioned in the womb, God was there, preparing things, orchestrating things. Thousands of years before that, my grandparents, 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 Christ was there. He's the one that was before me, and therefore he deserves to be preferred before me. John was one that put Christ in the proper place. Go to John chapter 3 and verse 30. John 3 verse 30. John 3 verse 30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthy and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. What's Christ's proper place in your life? Above all. He is above everything. He cometh from above. We are earthly. We are doing our best to get along down here. But he that cometh from heaven is above all. Ultimately, in my life, I desire that Christ would increase and I would decrease. Even as John the Baptist here gives Christ the proper place, we can learn from that and give Christ the proper place in our own lives. John chapter 12, verse 32, I'll read it. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Now, of course, Christ here is talking about his death, but by application, we can use it. How often do we say, hey, if Christ is lifted up, He'll draw all men unto him. If Christ is lifted up, yeah, 2,000 years ago when he did that back then, he was lifted up, and now all men are drawn of the Holy Ghost to that perfect opportunity of salvation that he provided. 
But there's also a practical moment-by-moment -moment application that if I'm exalting my Savior in my life, having Him increase and myself and my will decrease, Christ will guarantee you, draw all men unto Himself through your life, through your example. And John the Baptist was one that put Christ in the proper place. He was also one who knew the giver. Go to John chapter 1 and verse 16. John chapter 1, verse 16. We need to know the giver. And of his fullness have we all received. Okay? And grace for grace. Three times it just basically said that gift was given. Something was received. Grace came for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Go to John chapter 3 and verse 27. John 3, 27. It said, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. And he knew the giver. He knew the one that could give him what he needed to receive. Understanding, I can't receive anything. Anything that I have it was given me of the God that created this whole world. I can receive nothing but that he giveth it. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. John chapter 3 and verse 33. says, He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him, the Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. And John here highlights that God is the giver of all. If I'm to receive anything, it's by his hand. And the greatest thing that we could receive of his hand is that straight path to the Lord that is through believing and receiving everlasting life. God came to this earth as the Son, Jesus Christ. He that hath received the testimony sets to their seal that God is true. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No man's going to go to the Father but by Him. The Father loves the Son and yet hath given Him that we could receive of His perfect and wonderful gift. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And recipients of a gift such as that, recipients of any gift that comes from God, that need to bring us to a spot where we're more humble. For John said, he must increase, I must decrease. God said, he, he said, I can receive nothing. As, as the uh, Pharisees were trying to puff him up and trying to, trying to say, hey, hey, this Jesus that you keep talking about, he's taking away your disciples. He's baptizing more people than you. His ministry is so much stronger than you, John. And he says, I couldn't have even received the ministry that I had were it for him. He must increase, I must decrease. And John was content with that. That makes you humble when you're content to see God exalted and yourself abased. You know what happens when you abase yourself? Hey, God will just exalt you more and more so that you can exalt Him more and more, so that He can exalt you more and more. And if you're constantly in a humble state, God will be able to do great things through you. John was one who was humble. Go to John chapter 1, verse 19. John 1, verse 19. John 1 verse 19, it says, And this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Now, I don't you think this would be a perfect time when John's coming and he's preaching and people are like, Hey, hey, who are you? You're a big deal. There's lots going on here, right? And then he says, I I'm not he. I'm not the Christ. And you can see they're trying to provoke him to kind of puff himself up in this scenario as you read on in verse 22. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? He said, I'm not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou, that we may give an answer to them that has sent, that has sent us? What sayest thou of thyself? And he says, I am the voice of one. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Go to verse 25. And they asked him and said unto him, What baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, uh, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. 
But there standeth one among you whom ye know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes latch it I am not worthy to unloose. That's how often John had to repeat himself and say, he is the one, he is the one, he is the one. And they're like, yeah, but you're doing this in your ministry. Yeah, but you're doing, yeah, but you're baptizing. Yeah, but, yeah, but you're, uh, you, you're as that prophet Elias. And you seem as that prophet uh, that, that was prophesied before. And he says, no, 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 no. It is he that is coming. It is he that deserves to be exalted. It is he that is preferred before me. Yeah, yeah, I baptize with water as a picture, but there standeth one among you. I'm not even worthy to lose his shoe. And he makes that statement from that position of humility. Bible records, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Go to Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 7, it said, And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet. So as John is busy in his ministry trying to humble himself and abase himself and decrease in his life, Jesus at the same time is saying, what went ye out for to see? You're, you're asking after this prophet Elias or this prophet that should come. He's more than a prophet. He continues on and said, Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He that is least is greater than he. The man that was lift up as the greatest born of women is bringing men to the kingdom of heaven and exalting even them greater than himself. Isn't that wonderful? How John's whole ministry was this, was this humble and lowly picture of a servant that Christ wanted to exalt. And here in New Brunswick, I think you guys got to be the same thing. Continue to take these applications as we read through them. If you continue in your humble servitude, as John the Baptist gave example to, if you continue to take crooked ways and make them straight to the Lord, you continue to take hills and valleys and, and, and lower them or exalt them in order so that people can have sure footing as they come to the Savior, he'll be standing there, maybe out of earshot, you'll never hear it. Maybe he'll say it in private as he did here to disciples that came unto him. There hath not risen a greater group of believers than this of New Brunswick. There hath not risen a greater group of Christians than these. Nevertheless, those ones that they're sending to the kingdom of heaven are greater than them. And they'd be happy to hear that. John was one that was humble. Jesus here makes the statement... In verse 14, And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. John would never say that. I'm not he. I'm not Elias. I'm not that prophet. That's not me. Lift up Jesus. I, I'm not a nothing in this ministry. If, if it wasn't for God giving me what I have, I would have nothing at all. Exalting him, exalting him, exalting him. And all the while, Jesus is saying, yeah, he's the greatest among women. Yeah, he's that prophet. Yeah, this is, this is my guy. Fulfilling exactly what I had planned for him in his ministry. Verse 5, John the Baptist is one who led others. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 1. Matthew 11 verse 1, it says, And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. Now when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, and, and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Now, some have said that this is a statement where, where John the Baptist here is doubting. Now, uh, I, I've, I've heard the arguments, it makes sense, you can, you can apply it, you can preach it, and, and have at it. it, it works. But then I start to think about the man John the Baptist. 
The man that was full of the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb. The man that, that, that left in that same womb. The man that followed after his cousin, his Lord and Savior, pointed to him when nobody even knew he was. Remember how he said, there cometh one? He's even among you, whose shoes wet latch it, I'm not willing to unloose. And when he showed up, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And then he says, This is he that should come. And he's constantly pointing out Jesus as the Christ. I'm not he, it's him. I'm not he, it's him. I'm not he, it's him. And then we find him in a, in a position where he's, he's in some, uh, he's in prison and he's, and he's in a hard time. And, and I, I'm sorry, I just don't see the greatest born among women buckling at this time, and then doubting. It, it, is it really, are you really my savior? Are you really my Messiah? Are you really he that should come, or do we look for another? No, but I think John was not showing a lapse of faith, but he was showing himself as a wise and harmless shepherd, leading those that followed him to the chief shepherd. This is the second time that you'll see a group of John's believers go from following John to following Jesus, and just in, in the pictures of scriptures. And here it's interesting because he's in prison and these guys are continually hanging around him. Well, he's made the statements, I must decrease, he must increase. He's made that statement a, a few times. He needs to be exalted. And they're still hanging around the prison with John. They're still, they're still listening to John. He probably knows that his time is about up. It's time for you guys to be cut loose and serve the Savior. It's time for you guys to be cut loose and get after your Lord. And so he sends them with this question. Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I don't believe it was John's faith that was wavering. I believe it was his disciples' faith that was wavering. And so he sent them to ask that question. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Go and show John what word is being told in your ears. Go and show John the things that you are witnessing with your own eyes. And what are they? And these are all things you will find contained in the scriptures that were prophesied way back in Isaiah that Jesus Christ would do. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor of the gospel preached unto him, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. I believe the offended were the disciples that had, had, had latched themselves onto John. They were holding onto a man that was being, being phased out, let's say. He was, about to, he was about to be beheaded, was he not? And so John says, hey, go and talk to the Lord. Go and get in the Word. Go and take the faith that I have tried to instill in you and make it your own. And how do you do that? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the very Word of God. And so they go and they say, Are you he that should come or do we look for another? And Jesus says, I fulfilled this and I fulfilled this and I fulfilled this and I fulfilled this. And you can behold it all in Isaiah. Yeah, go and tell John and also, Hey guys, blessed are those that are not offended in me. And the funny thing is, you never actually see them go back and, and, and proclaim these things. No, I think, I think John was wise. And he and exactly what he had intended to do, they went from following him and his ministry to following the Savior. And it was rooted and grounded and built up in the sure foundation of his word now. Not just on the shoulders of the teacher, the, the one that was discipling them, but now it was finally their own faith. They're following after the Lord and his word. Soon after, Jesus makes the statements, he is the greatest. He's bragging on his man. He's bragging on John the Baptist, saying there's no greater in the, in, in born of women than this. More than a prophet, this one is. Not a doubter. Not one that was lapsing in faith, but a wise man that was pointing his servants to the Savior. Soon after he was beheaded, it was over. They probably had no chance to even go back and relay the message if they were ever going to go there. This same John was the one that said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And who was that? That was Jesus. John was one with spiritual insight. Now I know the Bible says, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John chapter 1, and verse 32. John chapter 1, and verse 32. says, And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. You see how I have doubts about whether or not later in life John the Baptist was actually doubting whether Jesus was the Christ? 
He literally saw the Spirit of God descending upon him. He had that spiritual foresight and, and knowledge, and, and that, that, that glimpse into heavenly things was given unto him. I saw the Spirit, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. He's got the trifold, the tri-tetra of witness upon him. He's got threefold cord that's not easily broken as God the Father bears witness that when that Spirit comes and gives witness to he, you know that that's the Lamb of God. You know that that's the Savior of the world. John was given this great insight. But he not only saw these things, verse 34, I saw... And bear record that this is the Son of God. Not only should we see when we're given spiritual insight. Doesn't the Bible say that which you hear in, in secret? Proclaim on the housetops. When God gives you spiritual insight as John the Baptist was. He went and he testified of these things. you got to be one that's given spiritual things. And then uses them to testify of those same things. He is one that beareth witness of the truth. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. So, so far we've seen John as the one who knew he was sent from God. We need to be one that knows we're sent from God. He was the one who put Christ in his proper place. We need to exalt him in our lives. He was one who knew the giver. All that you have is because of him. Even that which you don't have, he is able to supply. He's the giver. He was one who was humble. He was one who led others. To the chief shepherd. He was one with spiritual insight, but not only was he given insight, because some of us get this in this habit where we get all sorts of Bible knowledge and we keep it to ourselves, but he was one that took the revelations of God and testified it to others. And he was one that bare witness of the truth. John chapter 5 and verse 30, the Bible says, Then, sorry, John chapter 5 and verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father that hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. And I just love this statement because this is Jesus Christ saying in a humble fashion that he was sent. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. My judgment, my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father that hath sent me. Verse 32, it continues. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Jesus again giving, giving credence to, to John, the bearing witness of him. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness of the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in that light. And all we can hope for in our ministry is that we would be one that bears witness of the truth. Just a reflection, just a lighthouse reflecting the light of Jesus Christ. Just a little, a little flicker of the light that is Christ and his glorious gospel. We need to be servants that just show forth our master. Just one, just the voice of one. Now what are you today? Are you just a voice or are you somebody impressive or are you somebody we should look up to? Are, are, you, are you just the voice or, or are, are you seeking to, to order yourself in, in the hierarchy of of this ministry here, are you are you are you are you coming after coming up on the heels of your pastor, trying to trying to overstep the things that he has going on, perhaps? Or are you just a voice? I think we need to be content to be as John the Baptist was, just a voice. Who are you? The voice of one. Who are you? The voice of one. I'm just a voice. I'm nothing. If anything is good in me, God gave it to me. To him be the glory. Amen. He needs to be lifted up. He needs to be exalted. And I need to just be lower and lower and lower, especially in my own eyes. Humble. A servant. If you can, go to John chapter 10. Be content to be just a voice here. 
I know you guys desire that your church would grow, your church would flourish, and it would be on fire for the things of God. But we need to be content first and foremost, not with something outwardly, not with our church that we're, yeah, amen, getting behind and trying to serve and trying to, trying to fight the good fight with and trying to yoke up with other believers and, and get the job done. We need to be content with our own self to be just a voice, just one, just, just one little speck in the grand scheme of things. Christ grows his church. You guys have no part in that. It'll be him that gets all the glory, and he makes it so. John chapter 10 and verse 36. John 10 verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. Now it's interesting. We've seen John the Baptist. The picture of John the Baptist, and we can apply all these things to ourselves. Again, we need to be one that knows we are sent from God. Personally, I was sent here for this purpose. I was sent here to be a blessing to my family. I was sent here to be a blessing to my church. I'm sent here to be a blessing to my pastor. I know I was sent from God to your door. I know I was sent from God to lead my children. I know I was sent from God for this purpose. Such a time as this. You need to be one who puts Christ in the proper place because if you don't lift him up, you will not draw any man unto you. You need to be one who knows the giver. You need to be one who is humble enough to give him the glory for it. You need to be one who leads others. And that's the ministry of making straight the path, right? Taking somebody that is confused about how to get to Christ and showing them the plain route to get there. Leading others to Christ. Being wise like John sometimes, to kind of, kind of use their scenario that they're in and their, their unbelief and their doubt and, and forming the perfect scenario where they can go believe the scriptures for themselves by going and seeking the scriptures for themselves, whatever it takes. Be wise to lead others. You need to be one with spiritual insight that shows and testifies these things. You need to be one that bears witness of the truth and you need to be content therewith. Jesus said, I am the Son of God. Are you going to tell me I'm blaspheming? I love how it continues down. This is talking about Jesus. It said, And many resorted unto him. And many resorted unto him. Now this is long after John led his disciples away so that he could go to his final end, having his head removed. This is, this is long, long after his ministry as, as a shining and a burning light had flickered away. This was, this was by, by the time where John is just, John is just, uh, uh, someone, someone that we behold in the scriptures is the greatest. He says, John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. And that's ultimately our, our, our ministry. None of us are, are, are going to, very few of us anyways, are going to be performing great miracles, doing great exploits, doing wonderful things. Are we content to just serve God where we're at, where we've been put, where he has us in this moment, just be a humble servant of his, and have people say, look, there, there's that, that, that group in New Brunswick, there, there's nothing special about these guys. They didn't know miracles. They're not doing these great things where the whole world would just look at them and be like, you know what, look, look at how they, they you know, turn people, uh, you, they're healing people, they're healing the sick, they're, they're doing all these, these great exploits that are just like, wow, and surprising and shocking. John didn't seek after those things, and I don't think we should seek after those same things in St. John here. John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And what greater ministry can you have here than to take the word of God and to talk about Jesus? Amen. Take this scripture to the doors of people that are confused, that are mixed up, that are on drugs, that are hurting, that are sick, that are sad, and take it to them and say, hey, I know you don't understand where you're going, where you're at, this world, this problem, the, 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 the sickness that's going on in this world. But let me show you in a straight path. Romans 3, 23. Romans 3, 23. Romans 6, 23. Let me show you Revelation. Let me show you John 3, 16. Let me give you the straightest path I can to the Savior. You may not do a great miracle. You may not have a great work. You may not do wondrous exploits that the whole world over would talk about. You know what? You'd be in good company with John the Baptist, the greatest 
um, born among women. Amen. He did no miracle, but everything that he spoke of about Jesus was true. Amen. He did nothing that people would be like, wow, look at his, look at his long apparel. Look at how, how beautiful he looks when he's in the pulpit. Look at his great masterpiece sermons that come across. He's a genius. He's wonderful. He's fantastic. No, they saw a man with, with camel's fur on and locusts in his teeth. He did no miracle. There was nothing fantastic about this man. And you know what? There may never be nothing fantastic about this group of believers. But will God be able to look back on you and say, look, they exalted me and everything. Everything that they spoke of about me was true. That could be the greatest testimony of all. And those that are lifted up and sent to the kingdom of God, they'll surely rejoice over that because you're so humble in your ministry here that they were exalted when they arrived in heaven. The least of them greater than you. And that should be ultimately the whole purpose of the ministry here. Exalt Christ, lift others to the kingdom. Exalt Christ, lift others to the kingdom. Exalt Christ, lift others to the kingdom. Just be the voice that is saying the truth of Christ. And that's all you need. That's all you need to be here to be a successful ministry, soul winning, serving in your local church, ministering to people, strengthening people, edifying people. Nobody may look at you and say, wow, that is the most spectacular ministry I've ever seen. Look at lights in the sky. No, they'll say, perhaps, oh, they did no miracle. But everything that they spoke of the Savior was true. Everything. And that could be the greatest testimony that this area and this group could ever see. Is to just hear the Lord presented straight as an arrow. Take those mountains and bring them low. Take those valleys, lift them up. Those crooked places, straighten them out and say, here's the straightest highway to my God. Make them yours. Trust them. Amen. Amen.